Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. This week, Mike Briggs joins us to look at cattle markets, Brad Lubin updates us on the Conservation Reserve Program. We'll outline legislative bills that would change the corn and wheat checkoff. And Rick Rasby will give us tips on calving across the state. It is Ag Week across the country and here in Nebraska. Governor Dave Heineman and Nebraska Department of Ag Director Greg Ibaugh will make tour stops in the state next Friday to celebrate. Also to mark the week, the Nebraska Soybean Board has donated soy crayons and coloring books to every third grader in Nebraska. The project began last year to help students gain a better understanding of the state's number one industry. Mike Briggs is our marketing analyst this week, a week of uncertainty in global markets. We talked with Mike on Tuesday afternoon, the day of the biggest one-day sell-off the stock market had seen all year, and a rough day for the cattle markets. There's a lot of things going through my mind, and, and usually on these big swings like this, you don't know why they happen until quite a ways after. I think the market got pretty badly overheated. I think funds got way low on the market. And anytime the funds decide to get out, it's like rats trying to get out of a hole. It's just, they're, they're, and they just, it just waterfalls on top of itself. That kind of bothers me. There's a lot of people running around screaming that we've had our spring high and it isn't even spring yet. The whole thing was strange because you started this rally in February, which is typically your worst demand month of the year. So that was perplexing in and of itself, but the market's always ahead of itself. So it's hard to know. I, honestly, I think we just had a situation where I think the market got overheated. Funds were too long. They decided to get out. It's, it's actually good for the market to kind of clean it out and maybe we can start again. I wouldn't think we've already set our spring high. That would, that would be really disappointing <laughs> to a lot of people, especially when I know there's a lot of people out there buying 134 and 137 break evens and the market, market's only at 128. Today it's at 126, but um, I hope that's not the case, that the, we've already topped it. You know, it, every month we come out here, it seems like we talk about the same thing when it, when it comes to packers. And I was reading this morning the difference between pork packers and beef packers. And beef packers just, they just keep taking it and taking it. And it, when does it end? At some point, they're going to get their margin back. Typically, their best margins of the year are April, May, June. I don't know if that's going to be the case from the standpoint of I don't know that there's the big slug of calves and the overwhelming amount of cattle to slaughter that there typically is that time of year, but there'll probably be more. And we all knew that from about the middle of February through most of March, it was going to get pretty tight on cattle. And we talked about it off camera. Your shipments of export beef that were bought months ago are now happening, so they've got to come up with they've got to come up with the meat. So they're having to pay some of these prices and really getting themselves in trouble. It will correct though, and they'll get their margins back. Hopefully they don't take it all out of the feed yard's pocket. <laughs> and when we get to the consumer on the other side, gas is going up, all right? But $5 seems like it might be a little more on the extreme. Either way, how do you feel about that? Well, it, the more gas costs, the more dispos less disposable income those, those consumers have. And beef's high, beef's gonna stay high, beef's probably gonna get higher and it's going to be an expensive commodity and that's going to hurt people. Now the interesting thing about, this will get a little long-winded, but when we were having this big rally, the beef market kind of stagnated, didn't move very much, but it did come up and close the gap a little bit so the packer wasn't getting hammered too much. Typically your middle meats, your ribs, and all your steak cuts are the ones that carry the carry, carry the cutouts. 
through that entire rally, they didn't move. Why? Not grilling season. Those are grilling yeah. meats. You saw the cheaper cuts hold the carrot up. Well, that's what people are doing. They're buying on price per pound. What's going to be interesting to me is we get into grilling time. The grills come out of the garage. Are people with this expensive gas going to go pay for those expensive steak cuts? And then will that carrot, the cutout, go back to what it typically is? Well, those middle meats are carrying this thing, and maybe that's what gives the packer his margin. <laughs> maybe he doesn't have to take it out of my head. That's my <laughs> optimistic view there. I don't know. Uh, speaking of your pocket, how do you feel about corn right now? It's had a nice little rally for the uh, corn farmer over the last month or so, over the last week, really. Where are you, you have at? until the last couple of days, or really till yeah. today, yeah. and I think you've got the same situation. I think the funds got really long, and you've got a tail of two markets there in this corn market. You've got tight old crop stocks, and you've got at least projections on paper to have burdensome, burdensome supplies by fall. And the market knows that. So we roll into spring and we don't have any trouble getting the planters rolling and we get this crop in the ground and we don't have any kind of weather problem. You're just, it's just gonna be like air coming out of a balloon on this corn market. So I think, and a lot of feeders are doing this, they're buying out ahead, anticipating this lower corn price. I'm not gutsy enough to do that. But I also am just buying corn hand to mouth. I'm not reaching out there very far to get corn because I just think, I don't think corn has much life left to it. Having said that, our friends in China come rolling in here and buying a bunch of grain and it's gonna get really tight really fast and then we better not have a weather problem or this corn will run out of sight. Our grain marketing analyst next week will be Elaine Cub from the ARC Group in Lincoln. The state of Iowa now has one more step of protection for its agricultural producers. Governor Terry Branstad has signed a bill into law that would make it a crime for individuals to fraudulently gain access to a farm operation with the intent to do harm. It would also penalize organizations and people who help someone misrepresent facts to gain access to farms. Annette Sweeney, the chair of the Iowa House Ag Committee, says the law is the first of its kind in the country. We asked UNL Extension Ag Law Specialist Dave Aiken how the law compares to current protections Nebraska farmers have. They would need a law like Iowa to have that type of protection uh, because right now, you know, people can, you know, lie on their, on their application and uh, if, if the producers are smart, they'll have questions on there, have you been a member of, you know, Humane Society of the U.S. or something like that, uh, or are you taking this job to try to, you know, expose what some people might think of as animal cruelty or something like that, you know. People could lie about that, and and uh, there would be very little that, very little that could be done, and and that was the whole point of the Iowa legislation to try to to try to criminalize that behavior. It's low level criminal behavior, but you know it's still it's still you know a misdemeanor type offense the first time. Aiken says he wouldn't be surprised to see Nebraska consider something like Iowa's bill in the future. For now, Aiken says farmers should know their employees and simply not engage in practices that give rise to the negative video spread online. Two bills before the Nebraska legislature aim to change the state's corn and wheat checkoff programs. Both bills were submitted by Senator Tom Carlson of Holdridge. LB 1057 would raise the corn checkoff from one quarter of a cent per bushel of corn sold to half a cent per bushel. The current wheat checkoff differs from corn and soybeans in that each sale carries a set amount, no matter the price, one and a quarter cents per bushel. LB905 would alter that structure. We talked with Caroline Brower, the executive director of the Nebraska Wheat Growers Association, about that and other changes LB905 would make. The bill will change the statute for the Nebraska Wheat Board, and there's really three main changes, and you already uh, mentioned one of them, and that is we're going to be changing the checkoff from a flat rate of one and a quarter cents per bushel to four tenths of one percent of the market value. So that's a little bit of a change from a flat rate to a percent. The other two changes um, affect some of our research contracts. The Wheat Board would be able, like to be able to accept research royalties and uh, change some of their contracts from one year to multiple year contracts. And then the third part would be they would be able to accept donations and grants? Um, actually, that, that's that the, is the research royalty okay. fees. Now, what are the reasons for the change, specifically to the four-tenths of a cent? There are a couple reasons that have attributed to this. Um, the main one is our checkoff hasn't changed since 1989, and that actually puts Nebraska with the second lowest checkoff in the nation. Um, our acreages have decreased pretty drastically in the last 10 years, and 
wheat's just not been able to keep up. It, it, we've had to cut budgets, cut contracts, and we're kind of at that tipping point where if we don't do something, it's really going to impact the long-term viability of the wheat industry. So if the bill would go through, if it gets passed through, ultimately how would that affect not only growers but the industry as a whole? Well, the obvious one would be they would see a slight increase in, in the rate that they're assessed on their checkoff. But more importantly, they would, we, the wheat board would have the money to invest in the long-term success of the wheat industry. A lot of that you're going to see in research with UNL. Um, research accounts for about one-third of the wheat board's investment in contracts. Uh, another big area that would see would be in international marketing. Um, Nebraska exports about more than 50% of its wheat internationally. So it's a huge market for us. And so working to maintain those relationships and those markets is really important for Nebraska's wheat producers. If the bill would go through, what would be the increase in revenue? Obviously, it, it differs on what the selling price right. would be, but you know, how much more would you have to work with? Right. Well, the thing is, it's going to depend a lot on the year. The nice thing about switching to the percentage rate is that it's going to change the market. So when markets are, are high and wheat producers are doing well, we'll be asking them to give a little bit more. But when prices are down and wheat farmers are struggling a little bit more, we're obviously going to have to do more with less. What do the wheat growers feel about this? I mean, obviously, you know, you're taking a little bit more money, but you're using it to further the product. Right. The benefit of this is, like I said, it's a long-term investment for wheat producers in the industry. So that, that little bit, those few pennies on the dollar have huge economic returns. When you look at $1 invested in international marketing, returns $23 to the wheat producer. If this bill wouldn't go through, and it's already had strong support, but if mm -hmm. for some reason it wouldn't go through, what concerns would you have? I think our biggest concerns would be, how do you invest in research? How do we invest in the marketing? How do we invest and give wheat producers the tools they need to continue producing this crop in this state? Wheat research lags pretty far behind corn and soybean, and part of that is the wheat genomic structure is more complex, actually, than the human genome. Up. And there hasn't been as much private investment, and so you'll see wheat yields lagging behind corn and soy, and really need a lot of those funds to invest and give wheat producers the tools they need. Both LB 1057 and LB 905 are currently on the general file before the legislature. It takes a majority, 25 votes, to adopt amendments or move a bill from general file to the next stage of consideration. In Omaha on Monday, U.S. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack again expressed the need for a farm bill in 2012, saying Congress has to act this year. Vilsack also urged for more acres to be enrolled in the Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP. We talked with UNL Extension Public Policy Specialist Brad Lubin on Thursday about the program and the acres involved. The battle is not only do I plant corn, beans, or wheat, but also do I enter that into CRP. Right. So what are some of the incentives to encourage farmers to sign up? Right. Well, Secretary Vilsack has a challenge of, of trying to keep the CRP full. Uh, there are six and a half million acres that are set to expire this year, and clearly a, a wish, a desire to keep uh, land enrolled in the CRP. Uh, we do have a general sign-up that's starting uh, this month. Uh, we also have two new initiatives that, that he's uh, ready to announce. One was a, a continuous enrollment initiative for grasslands, wetlands, and wildlife habitat. Uh, some more targeted mm -hmm. practices that give producers an opportunity to enroll land uh, without the competition uh, in terms of bidding. A second initiative that's coming is for the very highly erodible land. Uh, some of that that scores out very high on the erodible index, there will be an opportunity to put some of that land back into the CRP in a continuous process as well. As you mentioned, he's tasked with trying to refill right. this program and there is a substantial amount expiring, six and a half million acres across the country. So, mm -hmm. you know, how, how do you refill that? Well, that's the challenge. Uh, most expectations are for the next farm bill to lower that cap. The 08 farm bill lowered the cap from 39 to 32 million acres. Uh, and right now, Secretary Vilsack has the task of trying to keep the CRP close to its 32 million acre cap. Even with expectations for a smaller cap in the next farm bill, he's announced these, these initiatives and this sign up to try and, uh, to try and keep it full. So the land that is expiring, what are the options for that uh, six and a half that's coming right. out? With that land that's coming out, you know, frankly, some of that land will not bid itself back into the CRP. Uh, it's not the, the same 
type of land that is now highly scored on, on the environmental benefits index. And so it's coming back to production, or at least it's coming back to agriculture. Uh, how to manage that land is a fundamental question. Uh, whether it comes back to crop production or whether it comes back to perhaps grazing land, uh, livestock production. Uh, but clearly you need some management plans for bringing this marginal land back into production. There are options for turning that land uh, back into farmland for beginning farmers. And what is the that layer there? Right. Because there is a, uh, a period that you have to kind of get right. in before. There is a unique opportunity for uh, helping the, the next generation of farmers uh, get on that land. Frankly, for the next generation, uh, CRP land that's returning to production might be one of the few opportunities to access new land. Yeah, that's uh, a, a great very, point. You know, in a very tight land market, it's almost an entry strategy. Well, there's an incentive program called the Transition Incentives Program. Uh, if a contract holder, uh, the landowner or, or the contract holder, the CRP, can create a long-term rental or, or an ownership transition plan with a qualified beginning farmer and rancher, an agreement during the last year of the CRP contract to turn that land over to the beginning farmer or rancher, uh, the landowner can get two more years of CRP payments. And what's uh, the urgency to sign up there, Brad? Uh, the urgency of that is to finish that agreement within the last year of the CRP contract. So it has to be agreed before the contract expires. One challenge, we're already out of funds to uh, uh, to fund those initiatives at the moment, uh, we'll have to wait on additional funding or additional authorization to see that program into the future. UNL Extension does have NEB guides available online at ianrpubs.unl.edu to help farmers manage land coming out of CRP. General enrollment for this year's acres begins on March 12th and ends on April 6th. With larger bins and faster grain handling equipment, grain bin accidents and fatalities are increasing. As explained in the March Nebraska Farmer, the most common incident is becoming entrapped in the bin. The article features Landon Grothy, a paramedic in Norfolk. He lists 12 steps for people outside of a bin to take to save someone trapped inside. Grothy describes a special lightweight tube used to help extract a trapped individual. You can read more about his grain bin safety precautions in the March Nebraska Farmer. Spring calving season is upcoming, if not underway, for farmers and ranchers. Earlier this week, we talked with UNL Extension Beef Specialist Rick Rasby about things to keep in mind going into calving. We started by asking about how nighttime feeding now can help for the future. Well, if you, uh, if you have uh, late March, early April calvers, and that's what we're talking about right now, um, uh, you probably want to start the, uh, a management strategy of feeding cows in the evening time or at dusk. And this time of year, it'd be somewhere between 5 and 7 in the evening instead of feeding them uh, in the day or in the morning. And uh, that actually, when you change that feeding uh, regime uh, and feeding in the evening, that'll push about 70% of those cows to calve during the day. And if you think about it, we're more alert during the day. Um, and if you push more of those cows to calve during the day, we're probably more uh, attentive during that time period. And, and if we do have to have assist, uh, we'll see those during the daytime. So, you have to start that about two to three weeks before calving. And again, if you're a late March, early April calver, this is the time to do that kind of thing. So that's one of the things they can do to start off and get ready. What are some of the other things they can do right at the onset to make sure they're ready, everything's ready to go? Well, one would be to make sure that uh, you have all the calving supplies ready to go. And that would mean that uh, you have uh, any kind of chains or pullers that you may need to use during calving time, that they're clean and, and functional and, and in working order. Make sure you have a bucket for water. Disinfectant would be good. Uh, the other thing would be is to make sure that uh, uh, you have colostrum available because if that calf doesn't get up and eat right away or nurse right away and get the colostrum from the dam, then you need to make sure that you get colostrum into that calf. Remember, colostrum contains the antibodies for that calf. Uh, that's going to be its first defense uh, against any diseases. And so getting that into the calf uh, right away, especially if he doesn't get up and, and nurse, is important. In fact, when you think about it, if they don't get up and nurse, you want to probably get colostrum in them by at least six hours and then again at 12 because by 24, four hours and they're not going to be able to absorb those uh, immune globulins into the system. And so that's pretty important to, to help that calf survive. The other thing is, is to make sure that you have those calving tools available. Make sure you have tags. If you weigh calves at, the, uh, at birth, then you have to have the weight uh, equipment, the weighing equipment as well. But just make sure you have those available and ready to go. Make sure your calving barn is ready to go too and that the, the head catch and the swing gates are all functional as well. So sort of go through that checklist, make sure you have everything in order. You bet. And, and you know, calves are expensive right now, so saving every one of them is pretty important. 
You, uh, one of the things you mentioned, a, a possible problem that could be out there is scours after birth. What can they do to manage that? Yeah, you don't ever want to talk about scours, right? Yeah, but, no. but you do have to have a plan, and, and if you do have an outbreak of scours, just make sure that you've consulted with your veterinarian to make sure that uh, you have that plan in place. Um, make sure you isolate those calves that have scours so they aren't spread across the rest of the herd. Uh, the other thing is, is that you've talked to your veterinarian, have a plan in how you're going to treat. The other thing would be to make sure that you have some electrolytes available because dehydration can occur very quickly in those light calves, and so be able to have that available to, to give the calf. What should people keep in mind about first-time calvers? What should they be looking at? Man, they're a, they're, a, they're a tough group sometimes to manage nutritionally because they're going to need extra energy after calving. And so just a hay diet, hay alfalfa combination diet isn't going to work for them. Uh, adding a little bit of energy in there in regards to maybe some corn, uh, distiller's grains works real well. Also maybe even some, uh, some silage if that's your energy source, but you're going to need a little bit extra energy uh, to meet that high energy need for that first calf heifer after calving. And then finally, you know, we talk a lot about the, the calves and, and the heifers themselves, but what about the bulls? You mentioned don't forget the bulls. You know, here we're talking about calving and we're already thinking about, I mean, we need to think about breeding seasons not that far away. And so the idea is to make sure that you have your bull battery put in place uh, you've purchased the bulls that you need, the ones that you have on hand. Make sure that they've gone probably through a breeding science evaluation. The other thing is, is it's now time to get them into their working clothes. And if they're a little bit thin right now, uh, that would now would be the time to get them picked up prior to the start of the uh, breeding season. So don't forget about the bulls. <laughs> well, we'll hope for the best weather. It hasn't been too bad so far. Really, we've been blessed. And I'm telling you, the, uh, uh, so far, the calving season has really gone extremely well. And now to see just how kind the weather will be over the next week, here's UNL Extension statewide climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we are again on Friday morning, a fairly uneventful week as we only seen one significant cold front come through, and that was in the Wednesday time frame, but it was pretty much moisture starved. Little more than a few sprinkles and drizzle were reported across the state, so overall the dry trend uh, during this last week looks like it's going to continue as we go forward in time. There is some slight chances of moisture moving up from the south and particularly for the area south of Interstate 80 as we move through this weekend. But overall, it looks like a significant warming trend is in store. Now, what well, the concern is with the wheat break in dormancy and, of course, the warm temperatures that have been pretty persistent across the southern plains for the last few weeks, that if we continue to see these extended temperatures in the 60s into the 70s without any significant cooling at night, that we're going to become more and more vulnerable to a late freeze, particularly as you get to Kansas southward with the crop so far advanced, at least the wheat crop. So it's something we'll have to pay attention to because these warm temperatures are well ahead of where we would expect to see for this time of the year. Do we, does this warm trend continue or do we have any moisture in the forecast? Let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we have in store. And as we go to the upper air models, the one thing I'll draw your attention to is that the that we do have a trough across the northeast and we do have this upper air low that's been split from this, this flow across the southern plains region. And this storm is expected to kind of break apart, see one piece of energy moving up into Kansas and then we'll see a reforming of a low across Texas as the weekend progresses. And we do expect to see some significant flooding and heavy moisture event for the eastern half of Texas and points toward the north and east of the Ohio River Valley as this weekend progresses. So for today, we'll be looking at the coolest temperatures in the northeast close to this jet core. We'll be looking at highs in the low 50s across the northeast. And as we get to the west with a downsloping component with this ridge building in, we'll be looking at highs in the mid 60s. Now as we go to tomorrow, we're going to see this low tries to eject up into eastern Colorado, but the significant moisture is probably going to be around Texas and that'll cut off that moisture feed to Nebraska. So we're going to be in the lighter end of the precip, particularly in the southern half of the state. The best opportunity will be for the area south of Interstate 80 and the clouds will increase as the day progresses. So we'll be looking at highs possibly in the mid to upper 50s across the southwest. If the cloud cover doesn't materialize, we're going to boost temperatures at least 10 degrees. And in the northwest where we're closer to this ridge core, we're looking at highs in the upper 60s. Now as we go into Sunday, we're going to notice that that storm system, the upper or low is sitting here over northwest Kansas, but the most of the moisture is again to our east. That's going to cut off this moisture getting in. So so we'll be looking at more of cloud cover than anything else. We're looking at highs in the mid 50s to upper 50s across the southwest and south central. And as you get up into portions of eastern Nebraska away from the cloud cover, we'll be looking at highs in the lower 60s. Now as we get into Monday, now when we start to see the big warm up take place, and it's going to be pretty persistent for the next few days. Looking at highs in the upper 60s north to the mid 70s south. And as we get into Tuesday, not much of a change. Again, low 60s to the mid 60s north to the mid 70s south. As we go into Wednesday, pretty much the same persistent uh, conditions. 
upper 60s north, mid 70s south. And as we go into Thursday, a slight cool down may be possible. We have a little piece of energy, but I don't think right now it's going to generate anything of any significant moisture. We'll be looking at upper 60s north to the mid 70s south. 8 to 14 indicates the warm conditions will continue from next Thursday to the following Tuesday. And there is signs that a significant storm may develop along the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains as we get into late next weekend, early part of the following week. As we close out the show, we take a look at the Market General Twitter feed. The Beef Magazine reports that Russia's food safety watchdog will ban cattle imports from all European Union countries as of March 20th to prevent the spread of disease. All cattle, small livestock, and pig imports are banned following the spread of the Schmollenberg and Blue Tongue viruses. The Nebraska Natural Resources Conservation Service tweets that the USDA provides disaster recovery assistance in 20 states, including Nebraska which received $825,000. Overall, $19.7 million were given to 20 states damaged by floods, droughts, and other natural disasters. The money is available through the NRCS Emergency Watershed Protection Program. UNL's CropWatch reminds beef producers to register for the West Central Cropping System and Beef Production Practicum. The focus of the event is efficiently and successfully integrating crop and beef production. They begin March 21st in North Platte and March 22nd in Brule. For more information, visit cropwatch.unl.edu. For more timely information dealing with Nebraska agriculture, visit our website at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Next week, Elaine Cub from the ARC Group in Lincoln will be our grain marketing analyst. We'll take a look at pasture conditions and management across the state with UNL Extension Forage Specialist Bruce Anderson, and we'll examine E85 usage in Nebraska. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. America's export of soybeans helps the U.S. maintain a positive agricultural trade balance. Nebraska contributes half of its soybeans for export. The protein and oil content in soybeans enhance the growing demand for higher protein diets. The Nebraska Soybean Board promotes research to develop new soybean varieties with higher protein and oil content for major agricultural markets. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.